If you struggle with chronic foot, ankle, or knee problems, you are going to love this week's video. See, a couple weeks back, I got to sit down with an entrepreneur who literally put everything on the line to create healthier, happier feet around the world. In the 13 years since that time, he's gained an army of loyal followers and managed to shake up the giant $365 billion footwear industry. Let's get into this. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So many members in this community have been asking recently about shoes and what footwear is appropriate for different conditions. And so I went out and brought in the perfect guest to talk about the subject. Steven Sashin, the founder and CEO of Zero Shoes is joining us today. Thank you so much for being here, Steve. It is my pleasure. At least I'm saying that so far after the intro, it's been great. Up until after that, I have no idea what's going to happen. That's right. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> could, could be. Let's just do it on the so, sled then. <laughs> I'm going to start you off with the most obvious question, I think, which is you jumped into a, an extremely difficult market with this business <laughs> idea that is saturated with companies with giant marketing budgets. And, and what made you do that? Oh, stupidity uh, and naive optimism. Um, and, and I don't know which was more. I mean, I, I'm, I wish I were joking, but it's literally true. Seven months into starting Zero Shoes, which was 13 years and two days ago, um, we had some guys who were, they'd all started at Reebok like 40 years earlier. And they'd been around. The footwear industry is very incestuous. People just bounce from company to company. And they said to us, you know, we believe in what you're doing. This natural movement thing is the most important thing there is. And we believe in you guys. My wife and I started the company. So, you know, we would start this company with you. But we've been in footwear for so long that we're not stupid enough to try and start a shoe company. And Lane and I literally both said, yeah, we're hyper optimistic and naive because that's how things get started. We had no idea how hyper optimistic and how naive we were until we jumped into it in, in, in many, many ways. Um, but we just didn't really think about it. In fact, the business started kind of as a joke. I had been making just these barefoot running sandals based on a 10,000 year old design idea. And people kept asking me to make some for them. And, it, you know, they told two friends and they told two friends. And one day a guy said, um, I've got a book coming out about barefoot running. And if you had a website for this weird little hobby you have making sandals for people, I could put you in the book. Well, I've been an internet marketer for a long time. I built hundreds of websites. So I rush home. I pitch this incredible opportunity to my wife, Lena, who assures me that I'm a complete moron and a uh, bad idea, waste of time, distraction from what we were trying to do to make a living, you know, horrible thing. Do not do it. And I told her I wouldn't, you know, and then she went to bed. And so I built a website and uh, she kind of growled at me the next day. And I said, you know, it'll be a case study for some search engine business things we were doing. And you know, maybe in about three months, I'll own this market. And it only took me six weeks. And we realized that this was a real thing. And I'll, I'll sum it up with a quote of Lena's, which is there's enough shoe companies in the world. You don't need any more shoe companies unless your shoes change people's lives. And that's what we've been hearing from people every day for the last 13 years and that's what keeps us going and frankly we have the, the 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 metrics that we have the numbers that we have are unlike any other footwear brand in history over half of our customers over half of our customers own more than four pairs of our shoes wow that, i mean there's there are the top like 10 percent own on something like 10 or more um and it's because once you get into this experience of letting your feet and body do what's natural you can't wear other stuff. It just feels wrong because it is. And so um, the way our brand has grown, and I'll stop ranting after this, is from people saying, hey, I, like with the, when we started out with sand, we started out with a do-it-yourself sandal making kit. And people would say, great, but I don't want to make my own. So we came yeah. up with a way of doing a ready-to-wear version. I have a patent on a lacing system that we came up with. Um, then they said, that's cool, but you know, what am I going to do in the winter or at work? And so we came up with our first closed toe shoe. That's great, but I need a running shoe. Then I need a trail running shoe. Then I need a, and it's literally grown just from people telling us what they wanted next because it was a hole that they needed filled so that their feet could be happy for some other activity or some other situation. Um, and then we have a really brilliant product team and we figure out some things that they hadn't thought of that then they go, oh yeah, that one too. Um, but it's predominantly been driven by word of mouth and people interacting with us on a daily basis. That's awesome. But you, you teed me up for the next question there, which is you said they can't wear anything other than zero once they try it, once they experience it because yeah. it's wrong. 
Tell me why it's wrong. What's okay. wrong with what these other companies are doing? Okay, so let me preface this by saying um, there are probably people listening who will think that I'm wrong. Um, ignoring the fact that I'm one of the five leading experts on what I'm talking about on the planet, ignoring that even if I didn't, wasn't the CEO of a shoe company, this stuff would all still be valid and relevant and true. That's okay. Um, what I'm going to suggest or invite people to try to do, and this is a tricky one, is if I say something that makes you go, yeah, I don't buy that or not for me, then I want you to wonder where you got the belief that's arguing with what I'm saying, because what I'm going to tell you is backed by hundreds of pieces of research. And I know that research doesn't convince people if they believe something. So what I want you to do is think, where did you learn this thing? And if you track it back from, you know, who told you to who told them to who told them, you'll eventually land probably with a shoe company that presented an idea that I'm about to show you makes no sense. This could not be more obvious. So I'm going to hold up a kind of prototypical shoe. And let me start with the first thing. Why does it have a pointy toe box? If that's the shape that, of your that, foot. Yeah, that was that was one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about is where the original last came from. No idea. So the pointy toe box, not a clue. The rest of it, I totally do know. In fact, all right, I'll start with that story because it's a really good one. Um, and then I'll go into the specifics of what makes a typical shoe bad and then so, why ours are life-changing in exchange. Wait, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, start with what a last is for the people oh, who are not well, familiar with it. Um, it's not going to be relevant for what we're saying, but the last is basically a foot mold. Um, it doesn't have toes or anything, but it's just a mold that you make the shoe around. Shoes, if they're unless they're like Crocs where it's injection molded, just you know they just shove the the material into a mold and it fills up the mold and then they pop them out. Um, otherwise, shoes are predominantly made by humans by hand, um, and so the last is a thing they just wrap things around, glue things on, and then pop it out when they're done, basically. So. Yeah. Um, here's why modern athletic shoes look the way they do. Way back when, 50 years ago or so, uh, Bill Barrowman, the founder of Nike, was sharing a building with some sports podiatrists, or maybe orthopedic podiatrists, I can never remember. And uh, he said, I'm getting these new runners who are getting Achilles tendonitis. You know, what do you guys recommend? And the doctor said, oh, well, clearly they've been wearing higher heel dress shoes, so their Achilles have shortened. And so you want to make a higher heeled running shoe, like with a wedge of foam or something, to accommodate the Achilles. And so that's what Bowerman did. And the um, my favorite part of this story, there's two. The first is that when he did this, Arthur Lydiard, who was one of the most successful running coaches in history, more world champions and Olympic champions than anyone else coming out of New Zealand, a country with, you know, this many people and, and way more sheep than people. And so Lydiard says to Bowerman, uh, that design of yours with the wedged heel, like I'm showing, um, that's going to kill people. And Bowerman's response was uh, ostensibly, yeah, I'm selling a shitload of them. And the thing I can tell you about the footwear industry is when something starts to catch on, everybody else starts getting ready to copy it because they're terrified they'll never sell another product. So like when the whole barefoot movement came in in 2009, 2010, the shoe company spent the first year telling you that if you ran barefoot or got out of their shoes, you'd step on hypodermic needles, you'd get Ebola, your kids wouldn't get into college, your car wouldn't start. I mean, you know, you name it. They were just making stuff up because they were terrified that they would never sell another shoe. Well, okay, so that Lydiard story is part one that was fascinating. But here, cut to the chase 30 years later. A guy that I know that, I do, that I've designed some shoes with, one of them that's up there, um, he worked directly, directly with Bowerman for like 30 years. And so decades after the guys gave him, you know, gave Bowerman the idea for the elevated heel padded motion control shoe, my friend says to them, um, you know, your idea has become ubiquitous. Every modern athletic shoe is using that wedged heel thing. What do you think about that? And the doctor said, this is a track meet. And the doctor said, um, yeah, that was the biggest mistake we ever made. Whoa. He said, we were, everything we were doing was about prosthetics and orthotics, and so we saw everything as having a prosthetic uh, orthotic solution, but we had no evidence for, you know, the Achilles thing or what this, you know, adding the cushioning would do, and there's research that shows that the cushioning causes problems, but let's break this down. Let's take a look at this shoe. Again, pointy toe box, no idea why. That one's a mystery to me, and if your foot is shaped like that, guess what? It's not supposed to be. You don't do push-ups with your fingers squeezed together. You do push-ups with your fingers spread apart. That's better for balance, agility, or balance and strength production. Same thing with your feet. Um, your feet have a quarter of the bones and joints of your entire body. Bones and joints are made to move. If you don't let them move, all the tissues around them get weak. So here's a typical shoe. That's not even where your foot bends. So it's bending in the wrong place. And then it doesn't bend anywhere else. It doesn't even bend. I can't even get it to bend from the toe up where your toe is actually bend. Yeah. So that's a problem. Um, yeah. 
arch support. A lot of people think they need arch support, whether they have high arches or low arches, which is a weird thing. There's no other situation where I can think of the same solution is presented to people at either end of the spectrum, regardless. Yes. Um, yeah. Arch support weakens your feet because it's supporting your arch. It's not letting your arch function properly. And the reason it's even in there is because when you have this high heeled shoe, by the time your foot hits the ground, your foot is fully extended. Instead of being engaged, you have an arch in the bones of your foot. Doesn't matter if it's high or low, it's functionally the same. It supports you if you let it work. But when you land on your heel, by the time your foot comes down, it can't work properly. But leave that alone. Put your arm in a cast, eight weeks later, it comes out weaker. Put your arch support in your shoes, eight weeks later, your feet are up to 17% weaker. This is from research from Kurt, Katrina Protopompas. What was the percentage there? Up to 17% in 12, actually 12 weeks. 17% in 12 weeks? Yeah. Yeah, I would love to see that article if you can share uh, it after the Katrina year. Protopapas, you can look it up. Okay. Proto, P-R-O-T-O, P-A-P-S. Awesome. Um, so next. Um, you know, another thing, in addition to having a quarter of the bones and joints of your whole body in your feet and ankles, you have more nerve endings in the soles of your feet than anywhere but your fingertips and your lips. That's to feel things so that on the best case scenario, your brain is getting feedback about what you're stepping on or stepping in to control your body, starting by moving those bones and joints of your feet. Worst case scenario is um, reflexes. So some information goes from your feet to the base of your spine right back down. So if you step on a B, your brain doesn't need to think about it. There's a reflex that makes you recoil off of it by, by lifting at your hip. Well, um, with all this cushioning, you can't feel anything. So you've just made your feet numb, which means that they're dumb. So you're not as responsive. You're not as reactive because you're not getting the feedback either at all or fast enough. And this is going to sound ironic, but because your brain is looking for that information, research shows that you will often land harder because if you have cushioning in your shoes, because your brain is trying to get some information. And no, it's exactly the same. It's the reason why dentists tell you not to eat after you've had lidocaine because you can bite down so hard that you would cause damage because of the lack of sensation. I'm very familiar with this. Holy smokes, that's a, that just gave me uh, goosebumps just thinking about what you could do to yourself. It's, exactly yeah. the same It's thing. the same idea. Well, yeah. and here's and, and this is again the funnier part. Cushioning doesn't, e doesn't cushion even if you use it well for a couple of reasons. One is um, that, again, just the impact forces are mediated by your brain. But the other is that cushioning is basically tuned to a particular weight and a particular speed. So if you're not moving at the right speed and weigh the right amount, the cushioning doesn't do what it's supposed to do anyway. And it starts breaking down the moment you start using it. Here's the kick. You have a better spring and, oh, and they also, there's a term they use for cushioning. They call it energy return. No such thing as energy return. There's energy suck. You can't return more energy. Um, you can only see how little you can take out of the system. And again, that's based on speed and weight. So it's, I mean, if you want to talk physics, it's force equals mass times acceleration. It's the same issue. And then you apply that to your body versus you apply that to the, um, to the, the cushioning and it just doesn't seem to work. Also, you know, having a flared sole, uh, that changes the biomechanics of how you interact with the ground and puts additional torque on your ankles and your knees and your hips and your back. Oh, I forgot the easy one. Elevated heel. When you lift your heel up, even just a couple of millimeters, it changes your center of mass, moves your center of mass forward just a tiny bit, and you need to adjust either with your knees, your hips, or your back. And your so, head, yeah. or, and your head, um, all yeah. of those. Yeah. So, um, so let's see, have I found anything in this shoe that is good? Oh, the laces, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so let, let me let me sum up, Stephen, and, uh, and see if I, I did a good job here. So we have a narrow toe box that doesn't allow the foot to spread and do what it's designed to do. Well, and related to that, when you squeeze your toes together, you can't actually engage your arch, your longitudinal arch. There's three arches mm -hmm. in the foot, but the one yeah. we think of is the longitudinal arch. So you can't really engage your arch if you can't um, spread and flex your first toe. That's where most of the mm -hmm. power in your foot is coming from. And if you squeeze your toes together, that's all gone. So we have a narrow toe box that prevents the big toe from working. We have this heavy cushioning or, or foam padding on the bo bottom, which I love what you said there. It, it, it dumbs down the foot by lessening the sensory information, the sensory input. Well, let me let me let me highlight that for a sec, because what what good what quote good cushioning does your feet have mechanoreceptors. So basically they're feeling, you know, changes, physical changes. When you have cushioning, it spreads that force out over a bigger surface area. So your feet don't feel it as much or at all, but the mm -hmm. force is still there. It just bypasses your ability to feel it in your feet and goes straight into your ankles, your knees, your hip, and your back. Yes. 
Okay, so we're preventing the 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 foot at the front end from spreading out and doing what it needs to do. We're preventing the 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 toes from being able to flex and move the way that they need to in order for us to ambulate properly. Correct. We're also preventing sensory input from feeding the entire neurological system and allowing us to basically be safe. Yeah. And then we're elevating the heel, allowing us to do things that we would never do, or or you could even say forcing us to do things Correct. that we would never do. Correct. Yeah. Well, you know, here's a weird thing about, about elevating the heel. And by the way, you know, like the elevated heel, the flared soles, all those things, those all contribute to just messing with your biomechanics, just messing sure. with the way your, your foot would naturally interact with the ground. Um, the... Um, Oh man, I had a thought and then it just disappeared. Um, uh, wait, what did you say about it was the heel? Oh, oh, uh, he, wait, heel lift. Oh yeah, here we go. So even if you run with great form, but you're in a shoe with a big thick heel, um, yeah. when you're you're if you land on your midfoot and then your heel comes down to the ground, it can't come down all the way. So you're not Stop using your Achilles, really. right? Yeah. So you're not using your Achilles. Um, which is a natural spring. It's the, like the best spring ever made. And you're not getting the full use of that spring for what is literally free recoil, free energy. Um, so yeah. you're you're getting in the way of what would make running easier when you have an elevated heel. And then we should also mention that the uh, Achilles is directly connected to the arch structure via the plantar yeah. fascia and, and yeah. that entire spring ligament system that's all Does wired to work together. Yeah. So, you know, your muscles, ligaments, and tendons are the best springs and shock absorbers and joint protectors you can ever find. And the modern athletic shoe just gets in the way of using any of them. I mean, it's yeah. really amazing. It's funny. If you look at different kinds of runners, um, you see something intriguing, and that is sprinters have great butts. Yes. Distance runners have no butts. Yes. And it's because the way – it's mostly because sprinters are basically using them for the drive phase. I'm a Masters All-American sprinter. I haven't looked at my butt. I don't know if it's good or not. Um, my wife seems to like it. I don't know. So uh, so in, on the one hand, you're using it differently. But on the other hand, just the footwear that you're wearing, sprinters are essentially wearing practically nothing. Um, a sprinting spike is next to nothing versus distance runners who are being wearing big, thick padded shoes. And you can see they've got no butts. Interesting. So the shoe is taking over the work that the body should be doing. Well, it's attempting to, but then if you look at those competitive uh, distance runners, they're all banking literally on having a good career before they can no longer run, ha making enough money to support themselves or their family or their village before they no longer can run because the footwear is causing them problems. Wow. So it's preventing the foot from moving the way that it's supposed to. It's preventing the, the foot from spreading out the way that it's supposed to. It's preventing the big toe from engaging. It's preventing the spring system from working. It's throwing off the biomechanics of the entire kinetic chain. Yeah, but otherwise, awesome. <laughs> what does a zero shoe look like in comparison to the shoe that you just showed me? Uh, let's grab... Oh, wait, I'm going to grab one of my favorites. Okay, I'm going to grab this one. So we just do the opposite of all of that. Oh, I forgot to mention this toe spring here. When you have a stiff sole, it makes it goes up in the front and pulls your toes towards your knees, which actually yeah. strains the tendons and never lets them flex down. That's a problem. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a shoe called the HFS. Wait, i got to pull the paper out of it. Um, and we start with a wider foot-shaped toe box. So that's the ground. interesting thing that I see there when you show me the bottom of it is that it's actually shaped like a foot. Yeah. Wider. Who would have thought? Yeah, I know. What a shock. Crazy idea. Um, low to the ground for balance and agility. Super, super flexible to let those bones and joints move however they're supposed to move. It makes you more responsive to the ground as well because you're getting that flex. Like some people will say, oh, but I'm, I need ankle support if I'm in a hiking boot. It's like, no, if you're in a hiking boot with a stiff sole, if you step on something asymmetrically, not in the middle, um, then it'll twist your foot and then it, it puts your ankle in a compromised position. If you have something flexible, it allows you to flex around that thing and your ankle is not going to have those kind of problems. So, so super flexible sole. The sole also gives you a design. We have a number of different kinds. Um, we have soles for trail running, for road running, for walking around. Um, so it's designed to give you traction and protection, but also be thin enough to have that ground feeling that your brain is looking for to tell you how to move efficiently, effectively, and enjoyably. Also, uh, typical running shoes, they make the soles design. They basically make the sole so it wears out around the same time all the foam does which is anywhere between 100 miles and 500 miles, depending on the shoe. We designed our rubber to be more durable, and so it has a 5,000-mile sole warranty. Whoa. Um, so wait a second. A typical shoe is 
What was the one, one to five hundred miles? Like the the low end of that is these new super maximalist shoes, lots of padding, oh, yeah. and the, the a typical running shoe. They say three to five hundred miles, but research uh, from a guy named Dr. Brian Heiderscheidt shows that basically the foam is kind of crap after about one hundred and fifty to two hundred miles. Interesting. So two last things. One, they're really lightweight. Um, and so that makes a big difference. I, I'm trying to find there's someone who did the math, like every extra ounce you have on your foot, what that does, the amount of weight you're carrying over the course of a 5K or a 10K or a hike, et cetera. Um, I don't have that data, but it's a real thing. Um, and then we also make it so that you can wear these with or without socks and with or without the insole or sock liner. If you want a little extra protection, you keep it in. If you want a more barefoot feel, you take it out. So you I can, love what you did on the bottom by perforating that. Cool perfect. idea. Yeah, um, well, A, to make it lighter, B, to make it a little more breathable as much as one yeah. can. So, and then the other thing simply is, if you look behind me, you can see some of it. We've got a complete line of casual and performance shoes, boots, and sandals that people wear for everything from taking a walk to running ultra marathons to climbing mountains to CrossFit, yoga, parkour, pickleball. I mean, literally, you name it. We have people who are, you know, you know the game Dance Dance Revolution? Sure. We got people who are world champions in that. They wear our shoes because they're lighter and faster. Um, and we have a, we sponsor a number of Olympic teams. Um, we've got uh, coming up soon um, an MMA fighter named uh, um, uh, Rafael, Rafael Stotts, who's competing for a world championship title and he trains in our shoes. Um, we have uh, uh, people on a, a national ice hockey team who wear our shoes off the ice to get their strength back from what happens when they're in skates for hours at a time. And they say that they're skating better as a result, which is interesting. So, I mean, there's oh some of my favorite use cases. Uh, a customer came in, um, was trying on our shoes, walked around outside and was marveling about how much he could feel, which was a big deal for him because he was blind. And he said, it's like having a whole new sense. So yeah. the, even some deaf people are saying it's like having a new sense because certain kinds of deafness affect the inner ear and they weren't getting any feedback to offset what they were losing from that. So, I mean, again, like my wife says, we hear from people all day, every day saying these things changed my life, either because just the comfort or the use cases or just letting your body do what bodies are made to do. I, yeah, that's that's a really interesting thing. So uh, being in clinical practice for as long as I have, one of the things that I've noticed and I'm, I'm, I don't have a foot specific practice, but I look at the body from top to bottom. The amount of American adults whose big toe functions properly or what we would consider normal. Yeah. I mean, I, I could count them on, on two hands for 16 years of practice. Yeah. What you're saying about where modern shoes bend is exactly right. And, and big toes of people with the best of intentions, even people who are otherwise fit who exercise regularly and lead an otherwise healthy lifestyle, their big toes don't move properly. They don't flex the way that they're supposed to, and they sure don't extend the way that they're supposed to. And what you're saying about that, that the position that the shoe predisposes you to by being curved upward like that just makes so much sense. Yeah. Oh, and I didn't point that out, obviously. It's low to the ground, but also, you know, no heel lift, no toe spring. So, so we would call that a zero drop. Zero drop is when the ball of your foot and the heel are at the same uh, height. So you oh, can have so this extends all the way to the toe. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, if you put this on the ground, it comes up a tiny bit, but it's really that it'll flex down. If you have toe spring, you can't flex the shoe down. If you have a tiny bit of lift, um, that's okay as long as when you step in it, it's flexing down. I mean, you know, I can bend these the wrong way. So um, so that works out okay. And I highlight the, the difference about zero drop um, because you can have a zero drop shoe flat from the ball of the heel, but still have a bunch of cushioning underneath, which get, you know, defeats most of the purpose. And some people will say, yeah, but since it's flat, that engenders a more natural gait pattern. But then you watch people running in those shoes and it doesn't make a difference. Because again, they're not feeling what they need to feel to make that change. In fact, I should have started by saying this. What we're talking about is about form, not footwear. Because it's all about having the right biomechanics when you're walking, running, hiking, doing whatever it is you want to do. And if you don't get the right amount of feedback, it, you, you won't be able to engender that natural gait pattern. Because like if you think about running barefoot, not suggesting people do it, but it's awfully fun. Um, if you run barefoot, doing it with bad form hurts. Doing it with good form feels great. I mean, you can spot yeah. a barefoot runner from 50 yards away. They have this weird look on their face called um, – what's it called? Um, smiling. And you know they're having a good time. 
<laughs> so, but, but you can see that in general, you can see when you watch people run, like some people are just gutting their way through it because they think it's good for them. And then really good runners look like poetry in motion. It looks easy. Yeah. Well, you don't even have to be a really good runner for it to look easier or look correct. I mean, I'll tell you, if you want to see the people who consistently look like the best when they're running, just find any kid under the age of four who has to spend a lot of time in shoes. Ah, very well said. Holy moly. They've got perfect yeah. form. They land with their feet underneath their body. They have just yeah. enough of a little lean to kind of help them move. They're not applying any extra energy. They're usually smiling and giggling and laughing. They stop yeah. when they're tired. They start again when they're ready to get up. I mean, it's just fun. And really, it should always be like that. If you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. So the feeling there is that is that running is a is a fundamental skill and we're kind of we we figure it out naturally as children and then we lose the ability through disuse yeah. and and maybe improper input or imp yeah. improper footwear over time. Yeah. Now let me let me clarify that if you're not having fun, you know, you're doing something wrong because um uh, as a sprinter, you know, what's fun for me is going really short distances really fast in a really straight line. I can do the other stuff but I don't like it. So it's just not fun for me. So I don't do it. Um, yeah. I mean, I have a dog now and, you know, I'll like, I'll, I'll jog slowly with him, but jogging slowly is counterproductive for me as a sprinter. So sometimes I'll just say, okay, let's run. And he's a, you know, 35 pound little thing. Um, but he is fast. And so yeah. he'll, he'll drag me along faster than I can typically run. That's a blast. Um, yeah. but, um, uh, but again, when it comes to running, I'm not suggesting that everyone become a marathoner or an ultra marathoner. You just want to find the way that feels good at whatever distance you enjoy, even if it's only running to the mailbox and back. Yeah, yeah, I know. I agree 100 percent. So I recently got a pair of your shoes, the, the Aqua Trainers, because I've got a muddy slope back here behind my house and I only enjoy running when it's uphill. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah uphill and 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 it's a uh, dirt and mud so it's nice and soft it doesn't beat up my body and i feel really good i run up the half mile not super fast and then i'm tired when i get to the top and i walk back down um, my parents used to do a thing they weren't runners but say so they got into walking they would walk to this diner that was five miles away then they would have breakfast and they take a cab home <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but that but that's such a good point i i want to ask you a few other things number one this is a tough thing because I don't know that there's any data on it. At least I haven't seen it. How much of modern day foot problems, I'm talking Hallux rigidus like uh, type problems where the big toe doesn't move and it, and it stiffens up. I had a patient years ago who had to have his big toes replaced uh, because they were dysfunctional, which is not a fun replacement. Um, bunions, uh, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, heel spurs. Um, how much of this stuff is just related to improper footwear as as a guesstimate I'm, I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire on this pun intended um there is no research on that explicitly other than to say um dr Irene davis had a lab at harvard she now moved down to university of southern florida and the first thing she does with any athlete who comes into her lab with some injury is get them out of their regular shoes and into ours and um, or into something minimalist usually ours and so from her perspective would be uh, almost all. And the way she says it actually is this. If you think about it, human beings, especially in America, we have no sense of history. And we also think that everything new is better, which if I ask you to think of things that we've done that are new that have not been good, um, you know, that list gets pretty much infinitely long. So because we're horrible at thinking of unforeseen consequences and we always forget that, oh, we thought this was going to be great, and it turned into something really not good. Um, so she, her line is, in the 60s and the early 70s, we were playing basketball in Chuck Taylors. We were running in thin-soled running shoes. That's all there were. And we weren't seeing the number of injuries, the severity of injuries, or the type of injuries that we're seeing now. In fact, if you look in PubMed, the repository of all scientific research, and you look up information about the cause the cure and the treatment of running injuries prior to about 1972, you won't find anything. It just wasn't happening. Hmm. So it's, um, and, and Bill Bowerman, just so everybody knows, was a track coach at yeah. uh, Oregon State or University of Oregon? Uh, I think University of, yeah, University of. University of Oregon. Yeah, and, and he's uh, largely credited with uh, being one of the founders of Nike. Yeah. 
Well, you know what's yeah. funny? If you look at the first uh, shoe that he made, the first Nike waffle trainer, it looks a lot like our shoe, except yeah. with a little bit of foam in it, tiny okay. bit of foam. Um, cool. And I remember, I remember right. Yeah, I remember putting that shoe on my foot. I was 12 years old, and I was a sprinter then as well. And there was a yeah. tiny, it wasn't toe spring because it was flat, but it did have a thing where the foam underneath kind of like um, tapered off towards the toe. So it did have something that felt like toe spring, but it wasn't actually moving your toes back. So I remember putting these shoes on. They, were, they said, you can go try them outside. I walked out the door. I leaned forward just a bit to start running. It put me right up on my toes. And I'm thinking, that's how I run. I mean, it yeah. was a great shoe. And then yeah. they turned into, you know, big, thick, padded mushroom. I mean, once they added the wedge of heel uh, yeah. or the wedged heel, everything else followed. Because like with a yeah. wedged heel, you're, you naturally end up landing on your heel. It's yeah. very few people do anything other because basically the heel gets in the way and you have mm -hmm. to end up hitting it. Your heel's a ball. A ball is unstable. So then they had yeah. to try to build in motion control. But there's no yeah. amount of cushioning that's going to impact or affect the amount of force that you're putting on in on the ground. I weigh 148 pounds. When I hit the ground jogging, I'm hitting the ground with 500 pounds of force. When I hit the ground when I'm sprinting, I'm hitting the ground with 800 pounds of force. There's no foam that's going to mitigate that. And then again, by the time your foot comes down, you're in that weak position trying to be strong. That puts strain on your plantar fascia. I mean, there's like literally from the, the just having that padding under the heel, almost every other problem was discovered and then made worse with the solutions that don't solve things. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things that I've gotten some pushback on is like if I produce a, a video on bunions and I make the comment and, and I've pulled this comment directly from the literature that the vast majority of bunions are directly related to the footwear that people, yeah, jamming yeah, and elevated man. heel combined with a narrow toe box. It means you're jamming yeah. the weight of the foot into that wedge. Yeah, what, what, how, what, how do people argue with you? It's, it's strange. The argument is, is, oh, everyone in my family has bunions. <laughs> and, and, and it's a strange thing because if you want to look at evolution, evolution selects traits that help improve survivability. Every once in a while, you'll get a mutation where, well, where essentially nature's testing something. Well, there's also there's also a thing called a spandrel, which is something that evolves that doesn't do anything either way. And so it can persist even though it had no function, uh, pro, pro or con. But, oh, granted, but a, but a bunion would be a hindrance. Yeah, um, usually, yes. Um, and, yeah. but it's one of those, but that's one of those really funny things I love. Um, and I'm putting air quotes around the word love. I love hearing people argue for their limitations. It's like, yeah. so you really think that there's just no way around that. And that's just the way it is. And you just have to suffer with it. What I had a guy say to me, um, big deal investor, perhaps the richest guy in town. And he said, oh, I can't wear your shoes because I've had plantar fasciitis for 20 years. I yeah. said, no, no, that's not possible. He's what? I said, well, you can't have an inflammation, an itis for 20 years. That's just not the way it works. And he goes, well, you know, it's and funny. If you, if you keep reinforcing it every day. Yeah, a little, but even even then, you know, you'd find a way to not be so stupid. So he, uh, uh, he said to me, well, you know, it's funny. It went away for about a year and a half. I went, oh, you don't even have plantar fasciitis. He says, what are you talking about? I said, you have tight calves that are pulling on your plantar fascia and giving the same symptoms, but it's a different thing. Your calf just spontaneously released because you don't go from being in pain to not being in pain if you have an actual inflammation. That just doesn't happen. And the fact that it came back in one day, that, that's definitely the situation. And sure. I said, you know, I said, look, I was a pre-med and my friends who actually went into medicine, they were not smarter than me. And I can tell you that the guys who were talking to you they don't know the data. They don't know the research about this stuff. But here's the kicker. Um, I said, can you like walk bare feet in your house? He goes, oh my God, no, I got hardwood floors. Well, I had two thoughts. One is, well, if you think that the hardwood floors are a problem, put down some damn carpeting. But more importantly, you think it's normal that you can't walk from your bedroom to your bathroom without putting on a pair of shoes? Are you insane? And he was just arguing for this point. I said, look, if you want to keep believing it, that's up to you. I'm telling you that based on research, based on the experiences of hundreds of thousands of people, I can show you some exercises you could do while you're watching TV. And in about six weeks, you'll be able to walk to the bathroom without a problem. And if you want to go further, in about six months, I could have you running a 5K in bare feet if you wanted to. Yeah. Does it make sense if you're going back to the arm and a cast analogy? 
your arm comes out of a cast. You have two choices. Never use it again. Keep it in a sling because now it's so weak you can't do anything with it anyway. Or get a little physical therapy and maybe 8 to 12 weeks it's going to be strong enough again you can use it for the rest of your life. Would you not want to spend six weeks to six months to get your feet into a position where they can support you for the rest of your life? Does that make no sense to you? And he no, was just dumbstruck. This is, this is perfect, Stephen, because that's exactly what I was getting at. So the dental profession has done a phenomenal job educating the general public that, hey, if you want to keep your teeth and your gums and maintain them for a lifetime, you need to do these two very basic things a few times a day, every day for the rest of your life. Yeah. And other professions have not done as good of a job. I'll but tell you. We can say that with if if Dr. Irene Davis is doing this down in her clinic. Yeah. Getting people into your shoes is like step one. You're saying that getting people into their foot into a natural position and then rinse and repeat every time you take a step, whether yeah. you're walking or running, it leads to a more normal outcome. That just makes so much sense. Well, and here's a quote from Irene, um, backing up to your previous question about uh, the, what percentage of uh, foot problems are caused by footwear. Her line is, if we just got kids wearing shoes like zero shoes, um, in 20 years, we wouldn't be treating adults for the billions of dollars of problems they currently have. Yeah, there's yeah, going to be some prevention. Well, you know, there's going to be some. There are going to be some genetic issues. There are going to be injury issues. Sure. I mean, you know, not, it, nothing's perfect. But this is another thing that people like to do is they go, yeah, but I need fill in the blank because yeah. I have this special case, which yeah, yeah. normally is not a special case. Uh, but people like to argue for their limitations. And my quote favorite thing is when someone says, um, I have one leg longer than the other. My doctor told me I have a one millimeter difference or whatever number they give. It's always something really tiny. And mm -hmm. I say, look. Um, if you can stand on one foot and raise or lower yourself by exactly the amount of leg length difference that you have, I'll give you a thousand dollars. It's like, you, you, you don't have that. It's not, trust me, that's not the problem. And I can tell you another reason why I say that is I've got a friend who's got a one and a half inch leg length discrepancy because he broke his femur and they had to replace it with a titanium one and they had the wrong one and they didn't know that until they put it in. Whoa. And now walking is a little bit of a challenge for him. Running yeah. is no problem because running is basically just hopping from foot to foot. It's and one legged activity. Yeah. And, you know, your leg is never a static uh, length when you're doing that. Now, yeah, yeah, his gait yeah. looks a little funny because his shorter leg, he has to move it faster, or move, naturally moves faster. So he has to have yeah. a long one kind of catch up. But you would yeah. never know that, you know, the guy is about as deformed as they could make you. That's super interesting. Yeah, that, that he's, a, he's almost better off running than he is walking or standing. He's better off running, and he's, he's best running on the side of a road where his shorter <laughs> leg is on the upside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <That's> <laughs> um, I, have, I have one last question for you, Stephen. Uh -oh. If a person has spent their life in traditional shoes, as most people in Western society have, yeah. <clears throat> and they're interested in going in the direction of allowing their foot to be in a more natural position, so oftentimes in the clinic, if we're transitioning somebody like this, we will kind of ease them into it as we would with like a standing workstation. Um, how do you recommend that people get, yeah, go ahead. Well, so when you would ease them into it, what would that look like? So if I was easing somebody from who had spent say 30 years sitting at a desk into a standing workstation, I would have them start off with say five minutes out of every hour and they would set a timer and they would stand for that five minutes and then they would go back into the position that they're accustomed to being in. So Same thing. these are things, or say if I'm starting somebody uh, with toe spreaders, which is one of the things that I love to do with people with dysfunctional feet, hey, let's make some space in there, which is exactly what your shoes allow them to do. Yeah. But I, I, I don't start them off wearing the toe spacers 24 hours, but, you know, all day yeah. in, the, in the very beginning because they would, it, they would be exceedingly uncomfortable and less likely to wear them again. So how do you recommend Same. that people kind of ease it? Yeah, so um, the big shoe companies back in 2010 when they thought this whole barefoot thing was going to you know, put them out of business, a couple of companies came up with what they called transition shoes. If you're going from something with a big heel, you want to go a little lower, a little lower, a little lower. Um, complete nonsense. So what you want to do is exactly what you said. You want to go cold turkey if, or hot turkey in this case because you're not quitting something, whichever it would be. It's post-Thanksgiving, whatever kind of turkey you have, tofurkey, <laughs> I don't care. 
Um, so you want to do this exact same thing. You want to either be barefoot or in shoes like ours and just do a little bit. If you're just walking, you know, yeah, walk for half an hour, an hour. See how you feel the next day. If you feel like you're a little sore, like you just did a little too much of the gym, wait till you're not sore, go back and do it again until you can just do whatever that little bit of time is enjoyably. Then just add like 10 seconds every next time. Awesome. Um, and uh, um, and similarly, if you're if you're running five days a week, you know you'll eventually get to the point where maybe one of those runs you do in bare feet or shoes like ours, and then you slowly build it up. So it's a titration process. Sure. I can't give a specific thing, sure. a specific time, because that depends on you and how your brain works and what you know, how neuroplastic you are and how well you pick up new neur new neural path, how, how quickly you make new neural pathways to learn new movement patterns. I'm I'm just really adept at that. So it took me like two weeks to make the transition full time, but I wouldn't, but that's unusual. Um, so it, it's going to be, my wife says it also best. She goes, our shoes are your perfect coach because they're giving you the feedback that you need to know if you've done something right or wrong. If it feels like you hurt something, that's a yeah. different story. But, yeah. but for either way, what you want to pay attention to is just a couple little things. If you're walking, it's, um, Let's how to describe this. If you're walking, you don't want to just kick your foot out in front of you and land on your foot the way you normally do. Um, the the let's see if I can teach this in 30 seconds. Yes. Stand up, lift one foot off the ground about an inch. Okay, just bend your knee, bend your hip, you know, just enough so your foot's off the ground. Don't do anything with that leg. You're only going to use that leg to keep you from falling on your face. Okay. okay. Now the leg that's on the ground, you want to drive it back like you know you're kicking a ball behind you, like you're ice skating. Okay? okay, you're going to push that foot behind you, and at the last possible, again, don't do anything with your front leg, other than let it naturally hit the ground when you're otherwise would fall on your face if it wasn't there, and then repeat. So take your back leg, what was your now back leg, put it up next to your other leg that's now standing on the ground, one inch off the ground, push that other leg back, like push the heel back, and let the other leg just naturally come to the ground. Now what you'll notice is when the other leg catches you from falling on your face, you're landing with that foot mostly under your center of mass. And when you're pushing that other leg back, you're using your glutes and hamstrings, two of the three biggest muscles in your body, in the way they're designed for hip extension. And so now if you smooth that out, you're going to start walking in a way that's nice and even and simple. I mean, because it'll feel robotic at first, but then you can smooth it out. And the idea is that you're landing with your foot underneath you and you, you may land flat footed. You may land on the ball of your foot. You may land on your midfoot. You may roll quickly over your heel. That's going to be based on whether you're going uphill, downhill, faster, slower. But the gist is your foot's underneath you and you're driving back with the other leg, not kicking yourself forward, not pushing yourself forward. Well, it's the same thing with running. You want your foot underneath you. You want to um, think about lifting your foot off the ground instead of pushing your foot off the ground. So if you stepped on that B that I mentioned before, you don't push off the ground to get off the beast because that would drive the stinger into your foot more. You flex your hip and it lifts your foot off the ground very quickly. You want to have that same kind of attitude. And if you want to learn even more about, oh, the other thing you can do when you're running, pick up your cadence a little bit. So don't run faster, but just have a few more steps per minute, just a couple. Because when you do that, with if you increase your steps per minute, and it will feel awkward at first because you're used to the pace you're used to. But if you, once you get used to this new pace, you'll notice that you're not reaching out with your foot and landing with your on your heel with your foot way in front of your body. You're landing with your foot more underneath you because there's just no time to deal with having your foot way out there. Um, and the last thing I'll say about learning how to do this some people just need to start walking around in bare feet to reawaken their brain and their nervous system to the fact that there's a connection between their feet and their brain. Mm -hmm. Some people would be helped by a little video feedback because mm -hmm. where they think their body is in space is not where their body actually is in space. Yeah. Some people just need a few cues because they're kind of naturals um, and just a cue to speed up the process. Like um, one image that I like to give is imagine your feet are on a wheel and they just barely touch the ground and you're ready to take them off the ground the moment they touch the ground. So you think about lifting your feet before they even touch the ground. So that way you're not landing on the ground. Your feet are barely passing over the ground at the speed you mm -hmm. want to move. That's a cue. Or think Fred Flintstone starting his car. His feet are behind <laughs> him and they never catch up. Okay. That's another image yeah. to use. Um, yeah. And then there's people, you know, annoyingly like me, uh, who just kind of figured out really quickly. And the problem that we have is that we end up doing too much too soon and then getting tired and reverting to one of those previous states, if you will. So sure, you know, sure. they just need to calm down a little bit. Um, but, the, yeah. but another recommendation, starting December 6th in America, already happening in the UK, the book Born to Run came out in 2009, written yeah. by Chris McDougall. 
great book if you're not a doesn't matter if you're a runner or not but it is a story about the Tatamara Indians in Mexico who run hundreds of miles either in bare feet or in sandals made with scraps of tire laced to their foot uh, they won the Leadville 100 race the highest ultra marathon in the world twice the first time in their sandals the second time in bare feet because they had a shoe sponsor and they couldn't wear the shoes so they just kicked them off and finished the race in bare feet um, and then it's a story about a race that we, that happened down in Mexico in the Copper Canyon with a bunch of people from all around the world to, who came to run with them and there's some science thrown in as well anyway that's a long prelude to that's what catalyze the whole natural movement, barefoot running, etc. movement. Uh, Born to Run 2 is coming out December 6th in America. It's already out in the UK. It's called The Ultimate Training Guide, and it is. It's all about everything you need to walk, run, hike, dance, you know, whatever it is you do on your feet, and to do it enjoyably, efficiently, uh, easily. Uh, and there's just little exercises. There's also an app that goes with the book, and there's just a bunch of little exercises that you can do to help you pick up these little differences in what your gait will be when you've yeah. been coming from regular shoes going into our shoes. Happily, the author Chris McDougall and his co-author and running coach Eric Orton are now partners with Zero Shoes because after 13 years of never promoting a shoe or even mentioning a shoe, they love ours so much they said, we want to partner with you and help you do this. Um, so awesome. that's really, really fun. But I'll give you one of the exercises. Um, you put your back against the wall and you yeah. run in place to the to while playing the song Rock Lobster, and <laughs> that's the, that's the pace you want to be at. Dun, Interesting. Dun, 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 dun. With your back against the wall. Back against the wall, because that so way, will really resonate with my audience. Because I, I don't have so many runners, but I definitely have people who want to walk better, who want to be able to walk further and more comfortably, yeah. or just stand during their day and go and conduct their life, but feel good doing it. So that's a great recommendation. And, and people will ask me sometimes, I'm on a concrete floor all day, what do I do? I got the same thing I just said to everybody else. So, you know, all the people, the 30 people in our warehouse, the 20 people in our customer service department who use standing desks, um, every time we go to a trade show when, with someone new in our company, they're always worried, like, what's, what's it going to be like? And at the end of every day, everyone's having the same experience, which is, um, feeling fine. And it's simply because when you let your, again, let your feet do what's natural, the rest of your body can do its job. If you don't let your feet bend and flex and move and feel, all the function, and that's all about balance, agility, and mobility, tries unsuccessfully to move into joints that are not wired for that, that take more effort to try to compensate. So if you let your feet do their job, the rest of your body can do its job. So well said. So well said, and I appreciate you you giving people the tools to kind of ease into the transition because what I don't want people to do is jump straight into the shoe like this and then try and wear it all day long and then and then go, oh my God, yeah. of course. It's, it would be like trying to run a marathon and running 24 miles your first day out. Yeah, or it's like just going to the gym if you haven't been in a while and just trying to do the workout you used to do. Um, it's like, you know, you, you start slowly, you build up on time. Now, the problem, of course, is you don't want to do too much too soon, but you don't know if you did too much too soon unless you do too much too soon. Sure, sure. But the good news is typically those things just mean you're a little sore for a little while. You'll get better. Then just back off. Do less. Have fun. Use fun as your guide. If you're not having a good time, do something different till you are. If it hurts, do something different till you're having fun. Um, and it really, it really is the way you should approach it. And Because if you're not having fun, you're not going to keep it up anyway. So, So well said. Thank you so much for your time, Stephen. This was awesome. And uh, oh, wow. I'm going to put a link for Zero Shoes in the description underneath this video. Hope everyone will go and uh, check your line of shoes out. And as I like to say, slip them on your feet and live life feet first. Thanks so much for watching. I hope that you found this interview informative and entertaining. Now, if you want to check out Zero Shoes for yourself and see what all the fuss is about, use the link in the description down below. I'm also going to put one here in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. But before you head out of here, make sure to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so that you're updated when the next video comes out. That's all for now. See you then.